Yeah, so welcome everybody to the Seed Library Summit. Um, I hope you've had a good uh, couple sessions. <clears throat> and uh, I just want to do a shout out to uh, Rebecca Newburn from Richmond Groves, who really was the, the force behind organizing all of this. There was a lot of people helping out, but she really made the epic effort. And it really came together just in the last couple months. So it was a, you know, a quick and let's do this and make it happen um, effort. And so just so thankful for all the people who helped make this come together. Um, so today's uh, session, you are in the session of how to start a community seed garden. Uh, if you, this is not what you wanna be in and I would go and get back to that menu and figure out which session you wanna be in, but this is the one we're doing to here. It's an hour and a half. We'll be talking till um, it's 1030 here in the, on the West Coast. We'll be going for an hour and a half. It's a little longer session. And I just want to get going here. So that's interesting. Why is Sorry, I'm just having a moment of my, uh, my PowerPoint is not wanting to move forward. There we go. So I just always like to start with a land acknowledgement. Um, I am on the unceded territory of the Southern Pomo and Coast Miwok people, which is now called Sebastopol, California. And I also wanna just, since we're, we are talking to people from all over lots of different places, I want to just acknowledge that the seed we work with is connected to peoples and cultures and spiritual traditions. And that we honor the work that went into these crops and have a deep gratitude that we have the ability to work with them. And I think that those of us who work with seed have a lot of work to do around acknowledging the people who have brought the seed to us. Um, I think we're really good at doing modern breeder appreciations, but I think we need to work harder to acknowledge the indigenous people from around the world that have gotten, have done the amazing work that took hundreds of years to get so many of these crops to us. So I have a gratitude and I'm humbled by that. So some housekeeping, just for everyone to know, this session is being recorded. We will be sending it out for people to be able to listen to. Um, the links will come to you through Eventbrite. So everyone who's signed up should be getting that. And we'll be keeping those available for a few weeks on Eventbrite. We will not be keeping them available for the long haul. There is some conversation about how to keep some of this resources that we're creating more available, but the event bright one will only be a few weeks. We ask that you stay muted and that you only um, unmute when we have questions, but would prefer most questions to come through the chat, just so that we don't have that interruption <clears throat> of the voice kind of, it can get awkward. At the end, maybe we'll open it up to more just um, conversation and then people could unchat. Um, my co-hosts are Electra and Elena and they will be posting things into the chat, including the survey that we asked that you fill out so that we can just get some feedback about how things went, what you liked or didn't like and so that we can improve. This presentation will be available in a public folder besides the recording um, and that folder will be emailed to you. Also, I want to remind everyone that um, we have tied the, the movie, The Seeds of Vandana Shiva, to this event, and that we hope people might join us tonight at 6 p.m. Pacific time for an introduction and talk with Ken Green of Seed Shed and the Hudson Valley Seed um, Library. And uh, then hopefully you'll take a chance to watch this movie over the weekend, which will be very powerful. The woman who was the director behind it actually came to several of our early seed library summits. And so she has, um, Camila has a connection to all, to the seed library movement. 
And um, if you do social media and wanted to help amplify this, this Seed Library Summit, you know, there was 1,100 1, people signed up for this, um, which is pretty extraordinary. And so we want to just really let the world know that we exist and that we're doing pretty outrageous work out in the world. And so if you wanted to amplify our voices through some hashtags, the hashtags we're using are Seed Library Summit, Save, Share, and Seed Library. So let's get into the talk. Um, this is really gonna be focused on how do you organize a community seed garden and how do you think about it? Um, the intention is that you both grow and share local seed and that we're really moving the seed library movement towards more growing and sharing of local seed and not just repackaging. Uh, so I am part of an organization called the Community Seed Exchange, which is based here in Sebastopol, California. We're about 13 years old. Um, we are one of the early seed libraries um, and excited about the history we have and how much we've learned and how much we've grown. Uh, within a few years of starting, we decided that we really needed and wanted a garden as a basis for doing our seed work. And we realized that we, the only way we would really be able to do mostly or grant, um, locally grown seed was to actually have a place to grow it ourselves. And we are very committed <clears throat> to uh, being a locally grown seed library. And uh, so we found a church and we were able to get some land and we started a garden. And we started a pretty big garden actually and it's grown a little bit in size. And uh, the Community Seed Exchange is probably one of the few seed libraries in the United States that actually is 100% locally grown seed. We don't repackage or share seed that is not, that is grown by other people in other places in the world, especially from businesses and companies. Um, so we have a um, majority of our seed we grow ourselves, and then we also share seed that other people in the community are growing and bringing in. We um, have a room that is our seed library that we offer the seed to the community. And we also offer seed through the public library. We teach classes um, every month, except for during COVID. And we also uh, help sponsor the, our annual seed swap, which is a much larger event that we work with several other organizations. So we do a lot of different things in the community. But the thing I want to focus on mostly, and I really want to encourage people, is to consider starting a seed garden and to expand your project to do that. Seed gardens are visible and vibrant spaces. Um, we want them to be visible because it's a great way to be teaching and um, educating the community about seed saving. They're a place that where you can grow more seed for your seed library or your seed swaps. They can demonstrate the process of seed saving to the community, especially if they're open to the public. We get to share the value and fun of growing seed. And I wanna emphasize fun. Um, growing seed is just an extraordinary process and it's just so deeply satisfying. And it's probably one of the more enjoyable parts of the um, work is just that we are in contact and working with plants and then uh, sharing the abundance that they share with us. You get to grow more quantity than most of us could do in our own backyards if you start a, a garden that's dedicated to growing seeds. And so that we actually are getting quite a bit of quantity um, coming out of our seed garden. And that really helps our seed library so that we have lots and lots of seed. Some people are really excited about growing, um, having community gardens where we, you give food away but uh, I wanna encourage people to think about the idea where you could give one lettuce head away or you could let those lettuces go to seed and give, have thousands of seeds to give away and you get greater impact because you can get more people growing food than you could ever grow yourself. So it actually creates a pretty big impact in terms of increasing the number and the amount of food that's available for people if they can grow. So why create a seed garden? Um, I. I just want to say that I do have a um, 
an understanding that the majority of people who run seed libraries don't have seed gardens. And so uh, I am basing this talk on really trying to convince people that they should do a seed garden. And I want to acknowledge that. And there will be some people on here who already have seed gardens. And I'll be curious and interested to hear from them a little bit if they want to share at the end. But I am assuming my audience is some are a bunch of people who have seed libraries and are interested in figuring out how could they do um, maybe grow some more of their own seed. And so I just really want to start at the beginning, which is the why, and to try to really convince people that this is a worthwhile endeavor. This is our this is our garden um, in early spring, and uh, it's a pretty big garden. I'll talk about it a little more. Well, I've been talking a lot about why you should grow your own seed and why you should have seed gardens, but 2020 gave us the big lesson, which was, I know here and I think across the country, people ran out of seed. There was a huge push to grow food. People wanted to garden in their own homes when they were all of a sudden home a lot. And there wasn't seed to be found. I This is a seed rack that was at our local hardware store and there wasn't a single seed available. And I feel like we've always talked in the seed library movement about just how do you create a resilient food system? And if you have no access to seed, it's pretty hard to have any food system. And so when things sell out and things get overwhelmed, um, like they did during the pandemic, or you might find when you have a natural disaster, all of a sudden your ability to grow is really limited if you're dependent on large companies to deliver all of your seed. And so one of the exciting things that happened for us in 2020 was as all of the seed dried up in all the stores around us and every seed company put a pause on, on seed orders, we realized that we had this amazing um, gift to offer to our community, which was we had a lot of seed in our seed library and we opened it up and figured out how to do it in a safe way and got thousands of packages of seeds out into our community. And so just the lesson was that local seed is a much more resilient option than seed from around the world. So how do we create resilient food systems? This is a map that many of you might have seen, which is the seed industry structure, which is a, a, a scary map because um, what you find is that there are five or six large corporations that control the majority of the seed that is grown in this world. They say that six, six corporations control up to six, between 60 and 80% of the seed that is used. Um, and I would posit that, that, that there's no resilience in that. If we are dependent on large corporations to grow to for our seed that we are in a very, very precarious position and that we need to build resilient food systems that mean that we are localizing our seed and the first, the first link of the food system is local and we're supporting local seed companies and we're also growing and caring for seed in our communities as seed sharers. So why grow community seed? Why spend the time to create a community seed garden? Um, well, the first is, do you even know where your seed comes from? That map shows that it comes from all over the world and it comes from mega corporations. Um, you know, I had a real wake up call about 25 years ago when a seminist seed, which grew a lot and still grows a huge amount of vegetable seeds for the world. Um, it was taken over by Monsanto. And I remember Fedco Seeds sent out a letter to all of their customers and said, we're trying to decide there's some really good varieties that are, are from Seminus, but we don't want to have our seeds connected to Monsanto. And they asked their customers whether they would want them to continue to have those varieties. And overwhelming people said no. But it was a wake up call for me about like that I didn't know where my seeds were coming from. So even though they were at Fedco or Johnny's or Territorial or Burpees, I didn't know who was the original sources. And a lot of times they're large corporations that are completely connected to um, the pesticide industry and the GMO industry. And um, I'm not sure that's what we wanna be supporting. So 
a way to counter that is to strengthen the first link of, the, of a local food system by growing our own seed. I'm really into the third one, which is this idea of caring for the commons, which I like to think of seed as something that's the commons. And it's a tradition that goes long back a long way, which is the idea that we care for the seeds and we pass them down to next generations. And we've really lost that. And we actually have broken that link that has gone from person to person for thousands of years. And um, I am hoping that the seed library movement is the movement that really, really that rebuilds that idea of caring for the commons and the passing of seed from generation to generation. I also, we also really love the idea of a sharing economy, which is that not everything can be, should or can be sold, but that we actually have an, enough abundance to share with one another. And I, I think all of us at the Community Seed Exchange love that we are sharing our seed and that we are giving it away for free to the community. When you grow seed, um, you are adapting your seed to your environment, to your climate. And so you are creating seed that will grow better over the many years if you do the same variety and you're growing it from the same seed, the same seed source. Um, you do get load of local adaptation, which is a great thing, especially in the world of climate change when we know things are changing and there's gonna be more extreme weather, the more you can get seed to adapt to the conditions that you're living in, the better, um, the, the stronger resource, uh, resource you'll have in that seed of being able to grow food. And all of us wanna um, protect genetic diversity. If we're dependent on a few big seed companies to get our seed in the seed library, so we're getting it from the companies that are out there that have excess and are willing to donate or from the local hardware store that gives us their old seed, we're basically going to be dependent on those companies deciding who, what we get to grow and what we don't grow, which they, they're not going to grow all the different varieties. And so one of the reasons why we want to grow community seed is that we get to then decide what we're going to grow and keep alive. And that brings me to the bottom one, which is gardeners are really going to be the protectors of diversity. Farmers have to think about the bottom line. They have to figure out how to get as much food crops out as possible. Um, they're not going to experiment thing, with things that maybe are a little bit unusual or don't you know, mature at the same time or <clears throat> um, aren't super high yielding. And so I just want to say that the, the, us gardeners are actually the people who are going to be keeping the diversity going because we have the ability to grow unusual crops that don't have super high yields, but maybe have other, some other things that are really worth um, keeping alive. And so I think that, that the seed diversity is actually in our hands and we need to really be looking at what are we growing and what are we offering to other people. And the other reason why I love um, community, growing community seed is that it's a great way to bring gardeners together to learn together. We have an amazing group at the community seed exchange of um, you know about eight really core people that uh, are all avid and passionate gardeners, and we get to learn together and watch how each other does things and um, hear about varieties that do well for someone else. And um, it's been an incredible learning experience to be working with a bunch of people who are really passionate about gardening and growing seed. Um, I was gonna see, is there any <clears throat> questions just about the why? Are we, does anyone, did anyone write anything? I would say not about the why. Okay. Cause this would be a moment to ask a question. Are there any questions at all? Yes, there is. Uh, there was a question about uh, how do we approach avoiding cross pollination, and I put a, a very short answer in the chat yeah. box. We'll get um, into that. Yeah, yeah. I figured you would. There's another yeah, question, mm -hmm. uh, and there's another question about um, how our volunteer activities are organized and maintained. Yep, yep. We'll get into all of that detail. <clears throat> I just wanted to start really big picture and try to convince everyone that this was a really valuable and important piece of, um, of the seed movement. And um, I really, really think that seed libraries need to move towards growing more seed and not just packaging up seed and offering it to others. So um, if you're starting from scratch 
and you are thinking, I want to start a community seed garden, the first thing you're going to want to look at is figuring out who are your collaborators, where are your peeps, who, who are the people who might want to work with you on this. Um, so the first thing would be if you already have a group, um, if you have a seed library group and you could just see how many people are interested in that. If you are running a seed library in a library, you might just explore who are people who come in regularly or seem excited and interested in helping out and seeing if there was some interest there. Um, you could go to local seed swaps and announce that you're wanting to start a community seed garden and to see if you can get some other people to join with you. Talk to local garden clubs. They're often wanting to find some kind of very specific project that they could work on. There's great community organizations like Slow Food or Transition Towns or ecology centers that often are interested in this kind of work. Ours spun out of a transition movement in Sebastopol. And um, it was from that organization that we launched our, seed, our community seed exchange. You can look to agricultural groups. Churches are great. Um, and they're also great for looking for a site. Uh, school gardens might be a place. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit further about the trickiness of merging with an already existing garden, but there might be a school garden that they're wanting an actual project. Master gardeners are both great for, are really great for finding people who are just passionate about gardeners and about gardening and wanna help out. And they're often looking for very specific projects where they can really be um, an assistant assisting. And then community garden groups are also a good spot to kind of look for people and also maybe sites. Sometimes seed companies, if they're locally based, might be interested in helping sponsor it or support it. And some local nurseries might be a place to post saying, we're looking for people who want to start a community seed garden. And there might be support there for you in that. So you're gonna first start thinking about uh, your organizational structure. Is this part of another group? If you already have a seed library, is it just something that's spawning out of that? Or are you starting something totally new? Uh, if you're starting something totally new, you might, want to you might want to think about how are you structuring it? Is there an official structure? Is it more ad hoc? Who, who is actually a member? Is it anyone who's passionate and excited and wants to participate, which is the way the community seed exchange is, is we don't have an official membership, but anyone who's really involved becomes is involved in um, helping run the organization. Uh, you, it's really important to start in the beginning to think about who's going to make decisions and how what is that decision making process are you working by consensus consensus minus one majority and who actually gets to make those decisions is there a process to that actually is a membership process or is anybody who's wanting to be involved. So those are just things you, you'll need to decide. There's not necessarily one way that's better or, not, uh, or worse, but it's just things to think about. Um, sometimes it's really helpful to have a core group that really holds the whole organization and then have other people just really be helping. Um, or you might have a, just a small enough group that you could have everyone involved in every decision, which is what we have. At the Community Seed Exchange, everyone who's involved can be part of every decision. Um, we have kind of committees that help decide specific things, um, but most everyone in the core group and in the who's involved in a regular um, in a regular way is involved in the decision making process. And then you have to decide is do you want to actually become a 501c3 nonprofit, which is a big process and costs money. And so I always think that if you're going to start something new, look for someone who will fiscally sponsor you if you need to raise money. We actually didn't do any of that in the beginning. We just did a garden and just used cash um, and had people put money in a jar at events. And then um, over the years, we decided that we wanted to do more fundraising and we decided to get more legit and we found a fiscal sponsor, which was a local organization that was excited about the work we were doing and was totally willing to have us come under their wing so that we could do fundraising, but we kept completely um, separate in terms of how we ran and the organization as a whole. So um, these are things that you might wanna think about that need to be held if you're running a seed garden or you know any kind of community garden, but a community seed garden um, in this case, is that you will be getting some land that you'll be caring for. And so you need to think about any kind of legal matters in terms of lease and insurance and um, 
what kind of commitment do you have to be able to be on that property? Um, I think it's really important. And I'm just gonna say the community seed exchange, we worked with a church and the church said, yeah, we'd love for you to do this. And we just went forward and we've had no official agreement ever. We've just been able to be there now for 10 years. Um, we actually are gonna meet next week to get a lease written for the first time. Um, if you want to have some kind of long-term um, feeling of being able to be there, a lease is helpful. What's nice is if you can get under another organization or be on somebody else's property, you can ask if the insurance will cover you also and so that you don't have to do your own insurance. Um, you need to think about who's coordinating and scheduling work parties, volunteers, meetings, um, regular garden maintenance. So there's always kind of a, how do you deal with all the logistics of what needs to get done? Um, you also wanna make sure that there's clear people to be contacted if there was a problem like the police need to get hold of you or the neighbors are complaining about something or um, you know people reach out to me all the time about oh I saw a leak in the you know in the irrigation and so you want to just make sure there's at least a person or a phone number or an email that people can get hold of you. There will be some finances needed and so you need to think through who's holding the financial management and budgeting. Um, and then you may need a fiscal sponsor so that you can have a bank account and do fundraising. And then there's that question of membership. So we've kept it completely open um, and we don't have an official membership process. There's other organizations that I know that actually have membership. Or, um, what we discovered was when we got into some legal battles, we, I'm talking about the seed libraries movement, is that um, when there was some legal battles a few years back when some uh, Department of Ag came down on a seed library in Pennsylvania, we discovered that it was better not to have membership that's official. Um, it's better to be that it's just a free sharing of seed to anybody in the community. So I, I would not encourage anyone to have a membership organization, but you might want to just get clear who makes decisions. And then you need to know who's going to manage the seed inventory and distribution of seed. If once you're growing seed, you're going to have a lot of seed. And so you want to just think through all of these things, which means that you're going to have to have meetings. Um, and you're going to have to talk through all of this with the group. And so you need to talk about who's doing what. You need to schedule work, plan on planning on what to plant, um, education and outreach, how to spend funds. We, our group meets about five or six times a year, sometimes more, sometimes less. Uh, we have a subcommittee that works on the, what are we planting group? Uh, we have a subcommittee that works on education and outreach. We have a group of people that work on our website. So we, things get broken down into smaller groups, but then we meet as a whole a few, you know, five times a year to kind of talk about what we want to do and think about what classes we're going to offer. Or last year, think about how are we going to get seed out in, with, the, with COVID and not wanting to open up our seed library. So you are going to want to meet and you are going to want to have a group of collaborators. This isn't something to be done by one seed librarian at a, a, a book library. You need a group of people and you need to build that solid core so that you have that ability to distribute the work between many people. And so I really want to encourage you to build your group of people to get the work done. Um, and the, we have probably, I would say we have like eight people that work every week in our garden and we probably have 10 to 11 people that come to our meetings. Um, some of our planning, our smaller subcommittees are more two or three people. And then uh, people, you know, we have had a core group of people about six or eight people who have been there for the last 10 years. And so we have some really strong history and knowledge, and then we have new people coming in all the time and then leaving, so. Some people wanna just get down to some of the basics, which is like, what does it cost to have a big garden? And it really depends on the size. I just wanna say, we have a really big garden. We have, um, we have 16 raised beds that are, um, I think they're 16 feet long. And then we have uh, 12, field, what we call our field area. So we have a pretty big garden. I think it's about 80 by 80, if my memory is right, 80 feet by 80 feet. And we grow a lot of seed. Um, this is a picture of our garden. 
Um, but the cost that the things that have cost us money are building the raised beds. Um, we have horrible gophers, so we have to have some raised beds, otherwise we lose too much. Um, if you don't have gophers, I don't know if you, you would really need raised beds. You could just do it all in the ground and that saves a huge amount of money. Irrigation is kind of essential, especially in the West. Compost, we buy compost every year. We haven't gotten a really solid composting system for ourselves going, so we do buy compost and some soil amendments. And then there's just basic gardening things like stakes and trellises. And then there's some initial seeds that we buy. Um, we grow our, we replant a lot of our seed, but we also will buy new seed when we're interested in some new variety. And I think our yearly costs for both the garden and all of our seed library costs, which include envelopes and lots of printing and labels is about $2,000. So it's not a lot of money. And um, we've been able to raise that money through just having jars out at events and then doing a very little bit of fundraising. And recently with COVID, we actually took all of our seed online and offered it to the community online. And we decided to set up an online fundraising page and we were able to raise more money than we've ever raised through that. So that was very exciting. But it isn't a lot of money, but it is some money that you need to think about. And we keep things really basic, nothing very fancy, but um, we try to keep things well maintained and cared for. So site selection. If you're looking to start a garden, you need to think about where. Um, and I would suggest looking around your library, um, community centers, churches, granges. I, I think community land, places that are where people come and gather and where there is a sense that this is part of the, you know, an area of the commons where people come work, or you might have city land that they were wanting to maybe do some kind of a community garden that you could convince them that this was a good use of their, that land. Most cities do have extra land that they're not sure what to do with. So you might need to just start asking around and um, I would start with maybe your city and going to the city planning department and saying, hey, we're wanting to start a seed garden, a garden that we're growing seed to offer to the community, like a community garden. And do you know of any properties? And they usually have tracked what properties are around. Churches are incredible resources. Most churches have extra land. Um, they, they are, I noticed that here in our community, they are one of the few places where there is extra land and they're worth talking to. We lucked out, we got a site at a church that we have been able to grow, um, have our garden for the last 10 years. And at first it was kind of like just there and no one really cared about it. And what's been so exciting is at our site, they have decided, I think the garden, the seed garden has made it so the church has really embraced their rest of their property, which they have quite a bit of property. And now they have a whole permaculture food forest growing up around it. And now they're, and they built a labyrinth for walking and they have an outdoor worship area. And um, we, I feel like we've created it for the church, this whole embracing of their outdoors as a community hub. Then think about what size. So size really is about like, how many people do you actually have? Do you have enough people to care for it? because it is a long-term commitment. When you grow seed, it's a long-term commitment to a lot of time and effort. Um, and so if you have very few people, I would start really small. Um, if you have very few people, but someone is just like, I am excited and I'm retired or I don't need to work and I can do a lot of the work, you could do more, but you wanna think about that. Um, and then just really think about how much seed do you wanna grow? Do you wanna have like, you know, you want to really just start building a small inventory of locally grown seed, or do you really want to do what we did, which was we wanted our inventory to be 100% locally grown, and we knew we needed to really up the commitment of growing as much as we could. And then I would say start small and then maybe hope that you could increase the size later. So find a site where there's room to increase. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about size later when I talk about kind of things you need to consider because um, one or two small raised beds just isn't going to work for uh, growing that much seed partially because of other things you need to consider like population size. So I'll get into that in a little bit. 
I hear that someone is unmuted. Could you please mute whoever that is? Hello? Someone's got some noises going in the background. So the other thing that's nice <clears throat> about, that you wanna think about for location is, it's really great if it's in a, in a community, in, like it's not someone's private home, but it's actually a community hub so that you can really use it as a place to teach and that you can, the people will walk by and notice it and see what's going on. You want it to be easily accessible where people can park. Parking, you know, if we have 10 people working in the garden one day, we need to have parking and um, bathrooms so that it's a place that people can easily participate and be part of it. Um, because you have to worry about pollination, you want to be able to control what's in flower nearby. So it sometimes could be considered hard to integrate into another garden. So if you have a community garden and someone said, oh, you could grow seed in these two beds, it, that would work for some things. And we'll talk a little bit, I'm not actually gonna do a seed saving class right now. So it will be, I'll be just doing a little bit of an, talking around the edges of it. But you do have to worry about cross pollination. And so you want to be able to control kind of what's especially going on within 100 feet of what you're growing. Um, and then for some plants larger than that. And so I think that it's a little bit hard to integrate it into a larger garden unless you have really good communication with the other people. Because you may be that you have a beets going to seed and you've been growing them for a year because they are a biennial so it takes a very long time for them to be and they're in full bloom and then it turns out that two beds down someone decided to let their chard go to seed and all of a sudden you've lost your um, beet seed and it's no longer going to be true so there is just some need to think about how to control the, especially the immediate area um, and it's, so it's worth thinking about the location and that it's not, uh, or it needs to be within, within, within a garden where you can tell people they have to take things out so you have some good communication. We like that our seed garden is connected to our seed library, so it's on the same site. Our seed library is not in a book library, it's in, in the church, and we have it open a couple, um, well, before COVID. It was open one time, once a week, and then uh, one morning, one Saturday a month, where we did classes but it's great if they're connected because they can learn people can learn they can gather seed and then they can come out and see it or vice versa they can be working in the seed garden and then go in and be able to get seed so when you're thinking about a garden some of these are just basic gardening things you need to make sure you have water to the site um, and that can be sometimes the most expensive thing for a new garden is making getting the water to the site uh, we have to think about Fencing, because we have deer in the area, but fencing is also good sometimes if you are worried about vandalism, just something that can be locked up at night. Uh, do you need a shed? We didn't have a shed for years. We just brought our tools with us when we came, but we eventually got us a shed so we could have all of our tools there. And then you also want to think about where do you take the seed once it's harvested? And we have not developed anything that's a communal space, but we just all take it home and dry the seed in our own homes and then come back together to process it. But if you had a, if you had a great site and there was a barn that you could then ask for use to store the seed there when once it's harvested to dry down, that would be amazing. Or a shed that could be used for that too. Um, I'm just going to mention irrigation is one of the first things you're going to want to think about, especially in the West. I know other people in the rest of the country don't think about irrigation as much as we do out here in California, but um, getting water to the site will be necessary. Um, and then putting in a really good irrigation system. One of the things about volunteer gardens is that you want it to be automatic. You want to make sure that it's not dependent on someone being there every day. Um, and so we have everything in our irrigation system automated to go on and off. And then we're just there once a week. The other thing about irrigation is that you wanna think through what, um, being able to turn off certain zones because when you're drying down a seed crop, you need that to not have any water. <clears throat> and so you wouldn't wanna have just a big sprinkler that you, can, that you turn on and waters the whole garden because there may be two beds that, um, have beans drying down and if you don't wanna be watering those. So you wanna make sure you think through how do you water some areas and then other areas you're actually getting the seed to dry down. 
And then you want it to be efficient, especially if you're in the West, we're in a terrible drought, um, but we use drip because we really want to be efficient, but you also may be paying for the water if you're on someone else's site. And uh, so you want to be aware of what that cost can be. So we spend, oh, maybe before I go into what to grow and the whole growing side, let's see if there's any questions around just site. <clears throat> I'm not seeing the chat right now. We are getting a lot of great questions, Sarah. Okay, let's um, see. You've Is already mentioned about cross-pollination. There are questions about the precautions. We need to keep things true to type. Mm -hmm. How is yeah. this different from a community garden? And has having your garden at a church ever been a deterrent to people of other faiths who want to get involved? Right. Sort those as you will. Okay. I'll get into cross-pollination and keeping seed true later. So I'm going to get into more of the seed part later. Um, we've never had a problem. We are not connected to the church in any other way besides that just being the site. And there's been, I think no one's ever really felt like, oh, we're, we are, yeah, I've never heard of anyone feeling like that was an issue. We just say thank you for, to St. Stephen's Episcopal Church for letting us use the land. But we, there's, I think people, it's not, doesn't feel like it's merged in. Um, uh, I'm looking, oh, someone says the Granges. I actually just got on the map. Um, Someone mentioned a hoop house. Yes, the hoop house would work. How is this different from a community garden? That's a good question, which is that it's a garden that's completely connect, community, uh, focused on growing seed. And so it's not like people have individual plots. It's that we have a small group of people who are caring for the whole garden and all of that what we're doing is growing seed. We're not growing um, anything but seed crops. And so that's very different than a community garden where Individuals get their own plot and they're growing, um, they're growing for themselves. Grange, oh, there's someone answered the Grange thing. Someone asked, is there any produce used to plant as the plant grows before it goes to seed? There is a little bit. Um, we believe that the majority of the plant should be, all of its energy should go into the seed. But when we have something and there's a lot of excess or we can harvest a little bit, um, we will share that. Like when we do winter squash, we're connected to a local nonprofit that makes meals for people who are sick. We'll actually have them scrape all the seed out and then they get to use the squash. Um, and uh, sometimes we'll have extra greens that we'll share um, with the local, the, the, actually the local food pantries on the same property as the seed garden. So we send things up there when we do have excess. Um, someone asked if we all do all local seed, um, where do we get our first seed? So just, um, we do buy our original seed unless someone has been growing it themselves. So we usually do have some local source and we're very, very careful about our local sources. We have a pretty stri stringent, um, list of who will buy seed from so that we're supporting small organic seed companies. And we have some that we're really, really excited about in the Pacific Northwest that we are um, committed to buying from. And then we also buy it from a few other companies that we think are doing good work. So when we first started, when we had all this, we started this garden, um, we thought, well, what are we gonna grow? How do you decide what to grow? And so these were some of the things we thought about. Um, we wanted to grow things that would grow well where we are. So. Um, it's not, you know, we're, we were trying to grow, we were trying to promote people growing their own food and having more food resilience and food security. And so we wanted to make sure that we were growing crops that were suited to our climate and worked well where we are. We also try to grow what people will eat. We actually used to talk about it and that we would all, we were interested in growing calorie crops that people could live off of food that you could live off of and be, you know, grow enough food in your own garden to live off of. But now I think we mostly think about it as what do people eat and making sure that we're growing some of that. 
we're interested in seed that has historical significance either to this area or maybe as a just a, a rare seed that we want to continue to have in the commons and the people growing out. Because we have a, a really strong group of long-term gardeners, we often will grow what people say, this is like my favorite tomato or this is a great pepper. And so we sit around and talk varieties. And if any of you are gardeners, you'll know that that's one of the funnest things to do in the world, which is to just talk to other gardeners about what they love and what they're interested in. And then I want to suggest if you don't have a lot of experience, it's worth even taking some of your garden and trialing different varieties. If you think, I don't really know which cucumber we want, it might be worth to do a trial where you grow five or six different types and then decide from there what you want to grow. But this is about what, this is usually how we kind of look at it. And then what we have developed is a list of what we're growing, because we've been doing this for 10 years now. Um, we actually have a list of the things that we're committed to growing year after year or every few years um, so that we're starting to work with adaptation. And so we're growing out our own seed every couple of years and um, having several successions of that. Um, we do sometimes buy new seed, but we're trying to more and more have like three different carrots that we grow and three different beets and um, really build that local adaptation piece into what we're, what we're growing. Every once in a while, my move forward just stops. <laughs> Let's show you if I can get it to move. There. I'm just going to show, I'm going to throw in pictures of crops and seed every once in a while, just so you can see them, because that really is the heart of why we grow seed, is that we just love growing seed. We love crops going into seed. We It's just an incredible, fun, full cycle that we get to be part of. And um, the picture is Bill, who is a newer member. He got involved a couple of years ago and he's been an incredible resource. He also got passionate about seed cleaning equipment and he's been building small seed cleaning equipment for us to utilize, which has been very exciting. But behind it is flashy collards, which is a beautiful collard and was incredible when it was in full bloom. And we got, um, a lot of seed. I think we got about a half gallon of seed, which was hundreds of thousands of seed from that um, from that plot. So, how many seed crops do you want to grow in a garden? Um, so, you need to think about the skill in your group. Do you have people who know a lot about seed saving? Because if you don't, then you're going to want to stay with really simple things and not get yourself too overextended. How much time do you have on a weekly basis to care for the garden? So if it's pretty small and there's just a few of you, maybe just do a couple things. Um, you know, a couple really simple things like beans and lettuce. Uh, and then you need to always think about, are you doing annuals or biennials for seed? Um, and then there's also perennials. We tend to most vegetables and we're really focused on the vegetables um, and grains. Uh, are either in the annuals or biennial um, bracket. And so annuals mean that they are gonna produce seed this in one year and biennials mean they need to overwinter and it takes, it's not till the second season that you get the seed. So things like carrots and beets and onions are all crops that are biennials and we grow them and then take them out of the ground. If you live where it's really cold, you take them out and put them in storage and then you plant them again in the spring, you know, we just take them out and evaluate them and replant them. Um, so they're a really big commitment. They're in the garden for, you know, months and months and months versus something like uh, arugula or cilantro that just is a, you know, just takes about three months to get a crop. This picture is of amaranth. We're really, we like growing unusual things. And also there's also some, um, barley and wheat in the foreground. And um, we like to promote people not just growing the most standard things, but that we could grow grains in a small scale. Um, and so we always have a few grains in our seed garden. Um, one of the things that's great is if one of you in the group is an organizer, because um, you want to keep track of everything you're doing, especially, it's always important to keep track of a garden. It's always good to keep your maps so you can track rotations, 
But in a seed garden, it's probably more important than ever is that you do, you really want to track what you're growing and you want to start tracking kind of when it goes in the ground, when it's being harvested, how much seed did you get? And so we luckily have come across that there's several people in our group who are extraordinary organizers and who are very good at Excel spreadsheets. They map the gardens, they track our rotations so that we're rotating throughout the garden and not planting the same thing in the same place. We, um, we wanna be tracking which varieties are we growing year after year. Um, we actually have a, a whole a couple people who track the inventory in our seed library and we go through and make sure we figure out how much of what seeds we have and what needs to be regrown because we're getting low. And then all of us are responsible for keeping things really well labeled. The minute they're planted in the garden, um, when they get harvested, when they get processed, and then when they get jarred up and put back into the seed library. Oh, and then if they get packaged up into seed packages into little envelopes, they have to get labeled too. These are, our, I'm just gonna show you a few people. These are our, some of our super organizers. Electra is one of them also, and she's on as a co-host, but this is Liz and Carol who have helped a lot to organize us. So when you're thinking about what to grow, you need to know a bit about seed saving. And <clears throat> there's a few things that are really core. And one of them is population size, is that to get healthy seed, you need to grow a certain population of plants. And it really depends on which plant. So and that's based a lot on how they're how they pollinate. And so um, some of the easy to grow for seed um, plants that also don't need very large populations are things like lettuce, beans, peas, tomatoes. And that's mostly these are mostly self pollinated. And so that means their flowers are um, have both male and female parts and that they don't get a lot of pollen from other crops. So they don't cross pollinate very much and they don't need a very large number of plants to get a really good genetic diversity. Harder to grow and you need a large population would be things like corn or carrots or broccoli. So um, those are ones that you might not wanna do unless you are have a large size and you're really committed to um, and have some experience with saving seed. So how do you even begin to know like what kind of population do you have? Well, there's actually some great guides out there. Um, this one, which is from seedsavers.org. They have a site um, and it looks like this. It's called the Seed Saving Guide. If you see, it has each plant and then over, it has how many, what population size do you need to get just viable seed, which is not really what you're wanting. You're wanting to do variety maintenance, unless you're working with a really rare plant variety maintenance is what you're going to be looking at. So with amaranth, you want a minimum of five plants or with a bean, a minimum of five to 10 plants. But then um, like if you got, if I went to the corn section of this seed saving guide, it would probably say a hundred plants minimum. So um, this is a great guide to pull up if you are going to start a seed garden. So you can kind of get a sense of the number of plants you want. The other thing that's important in this <clears throat> to notice is this section right here, the recommended isolation distance for seed saving. I'm going to talk about this in a minute, but this is another thing that you want to start understanding is how far apart does one variety need to grow from another to make sure that you're not getting cross pollination and you're keeping your seed true to type. So, um, you have to, if you're gonna, if you are gonna start doing a seed garden, you need to make sure you really understand seed saving. And so if you haven't done a lot of seed saving, I would take a bunch of classes and do a lot of reading and get some great books so you fully understand all the pieces. I'm not gonna do a class right now on seed saving, so I can only briefly mention these things you need to think about. But isolation distance is the idea of how far apart the different varieties need to be so that they don't cross pollinate with one another. And it's important for keeping things true to type. Um, the picture is of lettuce, which is a beautiful plant in full flower. And lettuce is one of those easy to grow crops. You only need to keep them about 10 feet apart from another variety to get a pretty good uh, isolation. Beans are similar, they need, um, 
when I'm talking about beans, I'm talking about the basic green bean, dry bean. Um, those would be about 10 feet also. But corn is a tricky one because you need a large population and you also need it to be about a half mile at the minimum from other corn varieties. And so that's always gonna make corn a little bit trickier to grow unless you wanna work and cover them and make sure that, cover them with bags and make sure they don't pollinate with other things. So this is just an important thing to think about. So when we're laying out our garden, we actually grow, um, in our garden, we grow usually six to eight varieties of beans, but we are very careful about where those beans are placed so that they're always within, they're always more than 10 feet apart from each other. Um, we actually do grow several different types of squash. And what we do is we commit to hand pollinating those so that they won't cross. And so we are actually there early in the morning um, working with the flowers and hand pollinating them, which is a very big commitment, which I wouldn't recommend to anybody who's starting a garden new. You wanna do that when you're more advanced. When you're planting your seed garden, you need to remember that seed crops get big. They're really different than regular plants, especially if that's, um, you, you don't eat the final product, like you don't eat the fruit. So tomato plants, when you're growing tomatoes for seed, it's the same size whether you're growing them to eat or to go, to, um, to go for seed. But something like a beet, which this picture is a picture of our beets, um, you know, beet gone to seed is like five feet tall and three feet wide. And so it changes how you think about that. So if you're wanting 20 beets for a good genetic diversity, and you also have to plan for them to be this big, you need to have quite a bit of space. And so um, you just need to think about that. So beets get huge, tomatoes don't really matter, peppers don't really change in size either. Carrots are a totally different crop when you're growing them for seed than when you're growing them for eating. Um, so you might wanna just get to know what plants look like when they're going to seed so you can know how much space you need for your different crops. So how do you get the work done? Because it's a lot of work. Um, and so what we do is we have regular work parties. We meet once a week for just an hour to an hour and a half. And um, we have a small core of like six to eight people who come once a week and work on whatever needs to be done. And usually there's one or two of us who are kind of thinking through what needs to happen or we'll talk at the very beginning and kind of observe and notice what, what work needs to happen. We also would, we tied in a regular work party with our educational event. So we have a monthly class pre-COVID <clears throat> and um, we would have a work party before our monthly class. We've also used groups that need community service. So the Eagle Scouts help, helped us build a lot of our raised beds. Um, you can get, school groups who just need their, they want their kids out to help work on a community project. Um, sometimes you can get help from rotary clubs or volunteer centers. So if you have a big push, like you're actually starting the garden or there's a big springtime push and you wanna get a bigger group, it's great to tie into these other, other community um, projects. I just wanna say again, these Eagle Scouts, so Eagle Scouts and Girl Scouts also, they have a gold medal project to get that those advanced, um, the, the, the advanced uh, Eagle Scout, I don't know what it's called, but to become an Eagle Scout, you have to take on a project. And so we've found, you know, I run several garden projects besides this, and I find that they're great sources of energy and they'll help fundraise for things and uh, they'll bring their whole scout group along with a bunch of parents to help make things get, help things get done. So they're great too. Um, and then we just let the community know that we have regular work parties. And so people will show up, <clears throat> sometimes they get hooked and they start coming every time. Sometimes they'll come once or twice and we don't see them again. So our work parties are open to everybody. And we just let the community know that these are when you can come and help the seed garden. So once you get all of these seed and you're starting to harvest it, you have to figure out what you're gonna do with it because you tend to not process it immediately. Most seed you're gonna harvest and you're gonna to need to get it to dry a little more. And then you have usually wanna store it somewhere until you can actually get to processing it. And so we 
have found that we actually are dependent on people having some extra space at home. So we harvest, when we harvest our seed, we put it in brown paper bags usually, and then we, people take them home. And luckily for us, we have a few people who have an extra space in their garage or an extra room where it can dry. It's pretty important to make sure it's not a place where there's um, rodents and where there's no moisture because you're really trying to get it grow down, to dry down, I mean. And then you think about how you're gonna process the seed. And we try to use those times when we're gonna process the seed to create educational moments or educational offerings. And so we usually will do one or two classes in the fall where we're teaching how to process seed and we bring people together. And then we have kind of a celebratory day where all of us who are really commit, uh, involved with the seed garden come together and we do one big seed cleaning day, which this picture is part of, um, where we actually try to get all the seed cleaned up uh, and ready to get back into the seed library. We found that it's easiest to keep this process separate from just the day-to-day -day gardening, um, but you could integrate it into the gardening work days would be the other thing, which is, and have people processing seed when there's time and there's not that much weeding to do or something. But in our garden, we always have something to do. So we, we've separated this out into a different time. And this day where we do the big seed cleaning day is probably one of the funnest days we have where we get to take all of that abundance and process it and clean it. And then we jar it up and we have so much abundance. Um, I just wanna say one of the highlights of having a seed garden is that it's an incredible place for teaching seed saving. When you teach seed saving and it's all just written or verbal and you don't actually have things that people can look at, I don't think people really get the wonder and amazingness of what it takes to grow seed. And um, what and so we really have used our seed garden as an educational hub. And um, this is a group of people getting a tour of the seed garden, and we're talking through the seed seed saving process for a lot of the different seed. I want to just point out the very tall flowering carrots that are behind the people on the right. Um, that is carrot in full bloom, and it's uh, about six feet tall. Carrot seed is really tricky because there's um, wild carrots that will cross with it. And so we're always trying to make sure that we don't have any um, wild carrots going to seed in the area. Um, last year, we had a huge crop of carrot seed of which half of it we think is true to seed and half we started seeing some wild carrot going to flower and we had to abandon some of it. Um, let's see. So this is the, the end of our seed processing day where we've jarred up all of our, a bunch of our seed and um, we have this amazing collection now of seed. And there's always that question, if you don't already have a seed library, then as soon as you have a seed garden, you're gonna have to start a seed library. But most of you probably have a seed library and are going the other way. So where your seed's gonna go, um, is hopefully into your seed library. We are unusual in that we keep all of our seed in jars and people take out the seed by spoons and just fill up their own packages. We do not package our seed for our seed library. So all these jars get labeled and with all the information about the plant and then put on our seed library bookshelves. Um, this is what our seed library looks like. We have five bookshelves that have seed um, in jars like that. This is from many years ago. Our seed labels have gotten really beautiful and um, we've gotten a lot more clear labeling, but um, people just are able to take seed and put it into envelopes. Um, and we just ask people to take only what they need. We also offer our seed at the book library. And so we do package up some of our seed. We take what we have the most of and we package it into envelopes with information about the plant. And then we put it in our seed uh, into the library in this little cabinet that the, seed, that the library gave us so that we can offer our seed to a larger number of people. And it's great to think about where else in town could you offer your seed? And, um, We've brought seed to community gardens. We've brought seed uh, 
to gatherings. We, there's a great scion exchange that the rare fruit growers do here in our community, and we always bring seed to that. Um, so there's just think about where else in town could you offer your seed. Um, and we also on, have a yearly seed swap, which turns into just a, a massive um, gathering of hundreds of people. And we bring all of our, a lot of our seed there. There's an, another couple organizations that also bring seed that they offer. And um, this is one of the ways that we just kind of put out a lot of seed very quickly in one, one event. Here's our seed swap. Um, at the Grange, which if someone was asking what the Grange is, our Grange lets us, uh, is the host of one of our seeds, our annual seed swap. So where are the bumps? Where are the things you might want to think a little bit more? Or like where, where have we had some, I'm going to just share what I know of our hard times or, um, and not necessarily hard. They're just things you need to think about. And so the first one is, is actually can be the gift, which is, uh, you can see it as a gift or you can be like, ah, this is frustrating, which is that you have a whole bunch of gardeners in one garden caring for it together. And so there's the gift of lots of different people who have different ways of gardening, um, but there also can be the just negotiating out what's what way are you gonna do it? And I just recommend everyone seeing it as a learning opportunity and being like, oh, I've never done it that way. I guess we can try doing it that way and letting there be a lot of learning of how many different ways there are to garden. But I suppose there might be some people who get frustrated by that process. And so that would, should just, you should just be aware of it. That that's a big thing to be consider. One of the things that does happen in these gardens is you do sometimes get accidental cross pollinating and what happens when you don't have true seed anymore. And you often don't know that you don't have true seed until you grow it out again. We try to get the people who take our seed to let us know if they have gotten some seed that isn't true. We've had very, very little response, but every once in a while we'll grow something out and we'll be like, oh, this isn't true anymore. So you can either just stop growing it and stop offering it, or you could put a big sign on it that says, this corn is no longer Hopi blue, but still a beautiful corn if you wanna grow it or something like that. Um, most gardeners don't love fundraising, so there's always that kind of balance of how do you get enough money to run a garden program um, and how do you build it in so that you don't have to spend very much time with that. We are lucky is that we have enough public events that we get a lot of money through just donations. And then um, having this page now when we offered seeds online has really helped us too. We also have gotten a rotary grant, and so there's sometimes just local funding and this last one is probably one of the things that we run into the most, which is we have a public garden and we don't lock it. And so we do get some vandalism. Actually, we, I wouldn't call it vandalism. We just get some people harvesting things. And so you have a beautiful bed of carrots that look amazing. And of course, people think, oh, why? Isn't, well, they're not even harvesting their carrots. Maybe we should take them or I just want to eat them or, uh, you know. Peas are a really hard one because when you see a whole bed of peas that aren't being picked, you you know, even if you're just walking through and you, you want to support the seed garden, it's hard not to just eat a few of them. So we have signs around our garden that say, please do not pick. We're growing everything for seed. We have signs on the door on the doors of the uh, the gates of the garden that explain what we're doing. Um, it's a you know the idea of trying to help pe stop people from taking um, Taking things is a good chance to really educate. Um, and we do lose things. So we, you know, we often will try to plant a little more, especially things like onions and carrots. We've really seen sometimes get taken. Um, so we'll plant more, hoping that we have enough at the end that we don't get too small of a population. Um, and I would say that you know you may have to think about locking if you had lots of vandalism. We don't, um, if you're in a really urban area where you might find more vandalism just because of the larger population, um, you may have to have a, a locked garden. We're really lucky is that our garden's really a part of the community and people are walking and enjoying it and all around a lot. And we just have to put up with some things disappearing sometimes. Um, so this is a not very good photo, but this is a group, the group, the day that we process seed with all of our jars of seed. And I just want to say, um, 
you know, growing seed is one of the most amazing ways to celebrate abundance. And abundance is just a, a lovely thing to put out in the world and to remind everyone that there is enough. There's enough of there's enough of us and there's enough seed and we can really support a more abundant and um, caring world. And I think it really makes it's really worth growing seed um, because of that lesson you get to learn from the plants. There's a few resources I want to share. Um, the Community Seed Network, which was a combination of uh, seeds, Seed Savers Exchange and a couple other organizations have created this website, the Community Seed Network. And um, I used to work with Seed Matters, which was a project out of Cliff Bar. And we created a lot of resources. And then Seed Savers Exchange has created a lot of resources. Um, this actually, there is a how to create a seed garden, community seed garden um, PDF on at this website, communityseednetwork.org. There's also how to create a community seed bank, how to create community seed swaps, how to save seeds. Some of, a lot of the resources that would be helpful would be at this site. And then um, there's another site, seedlibraries.weebly.com that has a lot of information for seed, the seed library network and how to start a seed library. And then there's a few seed, li uh, seed saving books that I highly recommend you getting if you're gonna get into seed saving. And even though I've been saving seeds for 30 years, um, I still read and look at them all the time. Um, the newest one, The Seed Garden, The Art and Practice of Seed Saving, which is at the bottom, is a really great resource. And it was created by Seed Savers Exchange. Um, and I think that's probably should be your basis. In the past, I used to say seed to seed, um, the Susan Ashworth book at the top was the Bible and um, the, now the seed garden has really replaced that, but both of them are incredible. And then um, De Carol Depp's um, Breed Your Own Vegetable Varieties, it's just fun to read, to think about not just keeping seeds true, but also beginning to think about how do we start to breed and create our own seed varieties. Um, she's just got a, a lot of information in her book that's really useful. So these are some of the resources I would recommend. So yeah, I just want to say our website, communityseedexchange.org, is um, a good way for you to just get a sense of our work, um, but we don't have tons of resources. Maybe we can, uh, actually, why don't I, I'll try to get this PowerPoint onto the resource page, maybe, of our website. So I want to open it up to questions. I know I've just been going, going, going. I hope this wasn't too much. Um, I'm sure there's a million questions about the how-tos. So has any, um, Electra or Elena, do you, have you been tracking the questions? Do you want to open it up? There's a whole lot of really good discussion in there. Um, okay of basic questions and resources. I think you made reference to several of them, um, but here are a few I wanna just throw out there. How long do you store seed for? Do you have resources on viability year in years for seeds? Yeah. Um, how do you encourage seed library patrons to follow through and save their seed and bring them back? And are seeds grown in soils with contaminants like lead okay to save and grow? Great. So I'll start with the seed storage. So every seed is different in terms of its viability, how long it will last. And there is a great chart, and I'm pretty sure it's at that um, seed, seed saving network, uh, the community seed network, I think has that chart um, where it will tell you how long most seed is viable for and each each variety so like onions are very they don't last but a couple a year or two but beans can last sometimes up to five years so it really depends on each seed and i would look for that chart um that i'm pretty sure is at the community seed network.org because we created it through seed matters and all of that went there Sorry, um, can so I, can, yeah. can i interrupt for a sec yeah so i, I would say also that um it really depends on how you store your seeds. So there are general parameters for the seed viability, but if you store them cool, dark, and dry, 
they will last longer. Yes. Cool, dark, and dry. And so one of the things I want to say is we're, we're really committed to short-term good seed storage, but we want to just get our seed out into the community and then we're regrowing it regularly. So we're not looking for long-term storage, but we are looking for good storage. Um, and we keep it at room temperature um, and we keep um, curtains over the bookcases um, so that they are in the dark, except for when we're open. Um, but we are really more interested in just getting the seed out. And so we try to just kind of cycle it out pretty quickly. Every year we do a deep inventory in the winter and we, we pull any seed that we think are getting too old. Um, and we either toss them or cook them, or um, if they're beans, we cook them, <laughs> or we decide that we're gonna grow them uh, that year and get a new batch going. Let's see, what was the question? I think, I do not know for sure about lead, but my understanding is that it shouldn't be a problem to grow seed in soils that have lead. Because lead, the contamination of lead is actually problematic in the eating process, but isn't necessarily problematic for the plant. And so if you were just growing them, I think that that would be fine. I'd be curious if anyone knows more, but my understanding is that that shouldn't be a problem. And then Elena, what was the other question? You had something else. Mm. Since then, we've gotten more about, do you have favorite seed storing tools? Yeah. You do germination tests. Yeah. So we do not do germination tests on our seeds. We say, you know, this is all volunteer and we don't guarantee our, our seed viability. Um, we do take a lot of our seed home with us in our own home gardens. And so we can kind of get a sense if things aren't growing, um, but we haven't been, we, we have over 180 varieties of things in our seed library. And so we just don't have the capacity to do germ testing. But I think, I mean, so what we just say is we, we don't guarantee anything. It's all volunteer. Um, seed saving tools, um, well, for 25 years, I just use seed screens and bowls and a few, you know, big tubs. And then um, this guy, Bill, got involved with our organization and I should have brought some pictures. He's been developing some really lovely small seed processing equipment that sometimes is easier and sometimes isn't. Sometimes it's just as easy to do it with your screens and then you can sit around and talk versus these loud machines that um, process things out, but some of the really hard seed that is very tricky for us to do by hand, it's been really nice for him to have, to have these new um, things that thresh and then have fans that blow out all of the chaff and then little screens that get, you know, moves, it moves through. Um, but really, I would say for most people, seed saving wise, I believe in sheets, Put a sheet down when you're harvesting so that any extra seed falls. Either store it in the sheets or put it into brown paper bags. Then use screens. I like, I have a really nice set of a few different screens and bowls, and then maybe a few tubs if you're growing a large amount. We grow corn, and so we actually do have a corn processing machine that runs, you run the cobs through and the corn, the corn comes off of that. Um, but other than that, that's really all we needed for the first eight years of our time. And then we've gotten now some nice, fun tools beyond that. Uh, let's see. Hey, Sarah. Yeah. Uh, this question has come up twice from uh, Carl. Mm -hmm. If you allow the community to grow and contribute seed, how do you ensure that those growing seed take the precautions needed to ensure true to type seeds? You can't. That's why we started growing our own seed <laughs> was we thought, well, the only way we can really grow high quality seed is if we're doing it. And we felt like, well, one, and maybe everyone who has a seed library has experienced this, this, you get very little, it's hard to get people to bring seed back, even if they're really interested and committed. There's only going to be a few people who actually bring seed in. We we never really were able to get much seed returned. So that was why we decided to start growing it as a community together, which was that we knew that we would then be able to grow a lot of our own seed 
and that we could ensure the quality. And so we actually now have labels that show which seed in the, um, our seed library is grown by us and which seed is coming from other places. All seed is labeled where it came from that we offer um, in our, seed, our main seed library because that's all in jars. And so, you know, when you're taking something that isn't grown by us, then you are, there's a chance that it's not true to type. I mean, the whole thing you have to remember, and I always just want to keep always stressing to people, it's just a big communal volunteer experiment. And we don't always have, it's not going to be perfect. And there's going to be things that aren't true to type. And there's going to be problems with things happening or, um, you know, we try to be really careful in our seed garden of not uh, with health issues and so that we're not moving unhealthy seed forward, but you can't guarantee that people aren't bringing in some seed that was from really unhealthy plants. Um, it's just part of what happens when you do this kind of big volunteer thing, but I would just say that's the reason to do it. You're, do it as a community seed garden is that you get to actually have more control of the seed and you have a whole group of people kind of studying and testing it. Do you keep seed grown by various people separated? I think that's along the lines of what you just said, but do you separate by gardener or by town? No, um, we have on the label who grew it and where did they grow it? And so everything that is labeled on in the jars is labeled by that. And so you just would look through. When we have multiple people growing the same thing, there's always a debate, do we combine them into one jar or do we keep them separate? And with beans, and if they're growing in the same year, like we did the One Seed, One Community project, we did combine different people's black, um, we did the Cherokee black bean. Um, we did combine those into one, and it was, we just wrote, it was from the One Seed, One Community project. No, Bill doesn't make these contraptions to sell, but yeah, it would be fun. I, I should do it for, I should do this for, um, we should have Bill show and tell someday to a bunch of the seed library people, all the different tools he's created. Sarah, we do. You... And so someone asked, do we encourage people to grow and save seed? We always encourage people to grow and seed, save seed. We offer classes throughout the year on how to um, do seed saving. And we try to always promote people growing seed in their own garden. And we actually promote our own core group growing seed because we, we have a huge dry bean collection. And so we often want to grow more dry beans than um, we can grow in our seed in our community seed garden. And so we will divide up and have people grow so we can get, you know, 15, 20 different seeds grown. We'll have them, people take them home and grow them for us. But we also just teach, we teach seed saving all the time. And we're always trying to encourage everyone to grow seed and get them to bring seed back. Uh, back to the equipment uh, topic. Uh, can you give advice on the best size screens to start with? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I'd have to go into my notes to remember the exact ones, the exact names of them, because screens are very funny the way they're named. But um, I do a very, very small one that separates dust out. And um, I like to do a me like a medium, which would probably be about an eighth inch holes um, where larger, you know, you can get, it will hold kind of the medium like kale seeds up, but dust will drop down. And then we do a bigger one that's probably a quarter, a quarter inch. Those three are a good one to start with. Um, there's an herb, Horizon Herbs in Oregon sells an eight screen set that's really nice. Um, it's pretty expensive, but they're really beautiful. And um, they have all those eight, if you have those eight, they're really good enough. If I may, Sarah, this is Lena. Mm -hmm. um, I have a spreadsheet of when we ordered seed screens and a member of our group made us the seat, the wood frames. So that helped us save money. I'll put that in the chat. Great. That shows people what size each great, each step was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yes. And that's a fun thing to do. We've done that off and on through the years where we'll have a seed screen 
making class or someone will make a bunch up and we'll offer them to the people to buy for the material costs. Someone says, can you just make up mixes? You could. We're really excited about varieties. <laughs> so our lettuce mix, we have, I mean, we don't have a lettuce. The lettuces we grow are very specific, like they're really good for heat tolerance or they're really good for this flavor or there's a rare one that only, we only know of one seed company still growing. And so we're really trying to keep it growing and alive. And so we are attached to our varieties. But if you happen to, I would say, especially if you end up feeling like you didn't have true seed or somehow they got mixed up in the process and you didn't know what bag you had, you could just um, give to the community um, a mix. But I would just say that, you know, we're actually really committed to varieties and really excited about the varieties that we're offering. So we don't mix things up. What else? There's a good one. Yeah. Okay, well, um, it's almost 12 o'clock. So I guess that we took up all of the time. I'm just gonna finish with this last slide. I don't know how I got out of share mode here. Um, but just to remember that this is a recorded session that you will get. Um, we asked in the chat, they put the survey. If you would uh, go to it right now and you could just really quickly fill it up, that would be great. And um, just to give us feedback, uh, we would love that. And just to remember, there's a break right now and then there's another session. So there is more to come. If you want, if you have any questions and you really want to understand more about having a garden, a seed garden, um, I did not put my email, but you can reach us at uh, community seed exchange at gmail.com uh, or through our website. And myself and a couple other people check that regularly, and we'd be glad to help people with more resources. Or if you're starting this and you have lots of questions, or if you live in California and you want to come visit, we love to share. Um, and we love to share pe with people what we're doing because we feel like we have a really successful model and we're super excited about that we're growing all of our own seed and that we're really committed to the seed saving process, not just the seed sharing process. So, thank you everyone for all that you do. I'm excited that we had so many people want to be part of this Seed Library Summit. It shows that the strength of the movement and the excitement around seed. So uh, thank you for what everyone is doing out in the world. And I just encourage you to grow more seed. Thank you. And that's the end. <laughs>